Good evening. My name is Karen Carey, and I am the Chancellor at the University of Alaska Southeast. And I am so excited that we are starting another season of our evening at Egan. And on this rainy, blistery night, blustery night, we are going to continue doing these virtually so that we can stay in the comfort of our own home and stay safe. And I am so glad to see all of you joining us this evening. And I am very, very pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Heidi Pearson. Dr. Pearson earned her PhD from Texas A&M University, majoring in wildlife and fisheries science. She also holds a bachelor's of science degree from Duke University, where she double majored in biological anthropology and anatomy, as well as biology. As an associate professor of marine biology at UAS, she teaches courses in marine mammalogy, marine ornithology, and herpetology, among others. In addition to working with the Department of Natural Sciences at UAS, she is jointly appointed to the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She heads the Behavioral Research and Ecosystem Health Breach Lab that researches the behavior and ecology of marine mammals and their role in maintaining healthy ecosystems. Dr. Pearson is a Fulbright Scholar. Her scholarship focused on translating the latest blue carbon science into communicable and actionable forms for policymakers, conservation managers, and the public. As a Fulbright Scholar, she worked with her host institution, Grid Arendal in Arendal, Norway, a Norwegian foundation that is also part of the UN environment. Tonight, she's going to present us with some very specific Alaska research and some research that I think is very specific to our area. So let me turn it over to Heidi and let's all welcome Heidi as our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chancellor Carey, for that warm introduction and thanks for all of you for tuning in on this Friday night. So I'm going to share with you some research that I've been working on for the past um, year or so specifically, but I'm going to start out by giving you kind of a broad background on some of my humpback whale research, and then we'll focus in on this specific question that we've been looking at during the pandemic. So the title of the talk is Humpback Whales and Tourism in Juneau, What Can We Learn from the COVID-19 Pandemic? So as Chancellor Carey said, the name of my research lab at UAS is BREACH, which stands for Behavioral Research and Ecosystem Health. And I study the behavioral ecology of marine, marine mammals, such as whales, dolphins, and sea otters, and how they are important to marine ecosystems. I also ask questions that can further the conservation of marine mammals, including how they're impacted by human behaviors. One of my primary study species is the humpback whale. So in this talk, I'll start by giving you some basic background information on humpback whale biology and why many people find them so fascinating. And then I'll go into some of my whale watching research with a focus on what we've been doing during this unusual time of relatively low tourism in Juneau due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The humpback whales that we have here in Alaska are part of the North Pacific population. And at the last estimate, the population size was estimated at about 20,000 and is believed to be growing at a rate of about 5% a year. In Northern Southeast Alaska, where we are here in Juneau, there is estimated to be about 1,600 humpback whales and they migrate here during the summer to feed. So this is a feeding area or we call it a foraging grounds for humpback whales. During the winter, most of the humpback whales that we have in Juneau and throughout Southeast Alaska migrate south to their breeding and calving grounds. Most of them migrate to Hawaii, but a small portion of them migrate to Mexico. And in case you're wondering, it takes about 39 days for a whale to swim from uh, Southeast Alaska to Hawaii that's actually been tracked before. So one of the reasons humpback whales are so fun to watch is because they perform all of these exciting aerial behaviors above water. 
They perform all different kinds of leaps or breaches, sometimes with their whole body, sometimes just with their head or their tails or their flukes. They also stick their heads straight up out of the water in a spy hop to check out um, what's going on above the water. And they can also slap their very long 12 foot long flippers on the surface of the water, which creates a loud sound. So we believe that all of these behaviors, except for spy hopping, are a form of communication uh, where whales can signal each other uh, in various ways. When humpbacks are in Juneau, their main job is to eat. So when they're on those breeding grounds in Hawaii or Mexico, they're fasting. And when they come up here to Alaska and other foraging areas, their job is to put on all of those lost fat reserves that they lose while they are on the breeding grounds. So in Juneau, we find that most of the time they are feeding on herring, but they also feed on pollock, salmon, capelin, and krill, and other types of zooplankton. Humpbacks also feed by bubble gnat feeding, which I think is one of the most exciting animal events to witness in nature. And we're really lucky to be able to see this fairly often in our waters here around Juneau. So humpback whales work together in groups to trap herring. The whales dive under the herring school and typically one of those whales will start to blow bubbles out of its blowhole to create a ring of bubbles or a net of bubbles. And at the same time, the whales are swimming under and around the herring school. One whale will also give a loud feeding call, which is thought to scare the herring and make them, more, make them move more closely to one another. And essentially the herring are encircled closely together by this wall of bubbles. The whales are then swimming around and under the herring school, pushing it towards the surface. And it's really neat to watch this from the surface of the water because you can watch this ring of bubbles being formed and then ascend towards the surface. And then all of a sudden you'll have eight to 10 or maybe more humpback whales emerge in the center of this ring of bubbles with their mouths wide open, just engulfing all of this food. And humpback whales also feed below the surface. So they are still lunge feeding with their mouths wide open and lunging through their food, but they're just doing this under the surface and we're not necessarily seeing it above water. In this photo, we see a mom and her calf on the left and then another individual on the right. Um, they're all diving together and they're likely diving in search of food along the seafloor. Humpback whales need to eat a lot to sustain their body weight. They weigh about 30 tons or so. And remember, they're only feeding for about half of the year. So they are spending a lot of their time feeding when we see them up here. And to sustain their energy, they need to eat about 2,000 pounds of food each day. We can get to know individual humpback whales through distinctive markings on their flukes or their tails. And each humpback whale has a unique pattern of black and white skin pigmentation on the undersides of their flukes. So when a whale goes down for a dive, like we see here, we see this pattern on the underside of their flukes and we take photos. And then through time, we can track individuals and get to know things like their travel and movement patterns, their grouping patterns, how often it has a calf, if it's a female and its health status. So essentially this pattern on the bottom of their tails is like a fingerprint that we can use to identify these whales. And there's a lot of power in just knowing an individual whale because of all these other things that you can uncover. And the neat thing about photo identification is that it's a, a totally hands-off technique. It's non-invasive. You just have to take a picture of the whale's fluke and then um, track it through time. So now for a short test, uh, see if you can match the whales on the left-hand side of your screen with the whales on the right-hand side of your screen. So you are using photo ID to match up these whales based on the pigmentation on the underside of their flukes. So hopefully this wasn't too difficult for you. Hopefully you matched those, those, and those. It's not always this easy, especially in Southeast Alaska, where we tend to have a higher proportion of humpback whales that have more dark than white on their flukes. 
So in my lab, we've identified 179 individual whales so far since I first started doing humpback whale work in Southeast Alaska in 2011. So um, I've been in Juneau now and at UAS for 10 years. And uh, most of these whales are shown here. So this is a poster that my summer research intern, Trinity Johnson, who was funded by the BLAST program. Uh, this is one of the projects that she worked on with me during the summer. And each of these whales here, we're looking at its fluke and it's a different individual. Each whale has a unique ID number and sometimes a nickname. And so in collaboration with other research groups in Southeast Alaska, we can learn a lot about these whales. So I collaborate with Chris Gabriel and Janet Nielsen in Glacier Bay. I collaborate with Alaska Whale Foundation, uh, NOAA Fisheries and this collective group, we can um, share our, our information and track these whales as they move throughout our region. In many cases, we not only know the ID of these whales, but we also know the sex. If it's a female, we know how many calves she's had. And sometimes we know the age as well. Uh, so humpback whales can live to be up to 80 years old, maybe longer. So this is basically the lifespan of a human. And when I look at this poster, the thing that excites me is knowing that each of these is an individual whale, each with its own history and its own story. By identifying individual whales, we can also learn about their social lives or their friendships. So by documenting which whales form groups with one another year after year, we can start to understand their social networks. Uh, so this figure was created by one of my research students, Donnie Varlman, that worked with me last spring. And in this figure, we are looking at 13 whales that are some of the more regular whales that we see in Juneau. They are the most sighted whales. And the lines on this graph represent the strength of the bond or the strength of the friendship between any given uh, pair of whales. And the thicker the line, the stronger the bond. And we're still unraveling what these results mean. This is just a first look at these friendships or these association patterns. But one thing that pops out to me is that there's this group of four females on the right side of the graph there that tend to spend more time with each other than the other whales. So I think there might be some interesting social dy dynamics going on there that we can dig into further. Using photo ID, we can also track individual movement patterns across entire ocean basins. So this is a screenshot from a website called Happy Whale, which has really transformed our, our ability to understand and uh, learn more about humpback whales. So the way this works is that researchers and also members of the public, citizen scientists can submit photos of uh, that they take of humpback whale flukes to this website. And then uh, Happy Whale has this automated matching process where it will automatically match the photos of the whales to other whales in the database. And so through that, we get to know the IDs of the whales. Through time then, and with many submissions from many people all across the world in some cases, we can track where these whales go. So in this example, I pulled up a pretty well-known whale in Juneau named Flame. Some of you that go whale watching might know her. She's a pretty famous whale, maybe one of the most famous whales in the world because she is the center of a lot of whale watching activity in Juneau. And on this screenshot here, we're seeing that Flame has been seen 217 times from 2004 to 2021. Most of those times she's been seen here in Southeast Alaska, specifically Juneau, but she's also been, been seen down in Hawaii on the island of Maui. So anyone can be involved in this process. So if you are out and you take a picture of a humpback whale's fluke, you can um, submit it to Happy Whale and get to know more about your whale. So Flame, uh, the, the whale that I just mentioned in that example is just one of many humpback whales that attracts tourists to Juneau. And Juneau is one of the world's premier destinations for whale watching. There are some important benefits to whale watching. On the economic side, um, an analysis done in 2019 by the McDowell Group found that there were nearly 370,000 whale watching passengers that embarked on one of 68 whale watching vessels within one of 20 companies in Juneau. 
So this is obviously a very important industry for Juno and the direct economic impact was estimated at $38 million in 2019. For comparison, this value was greater than the ex-vessel value of Alaska's herring fishery during any of the last 20 years. So in addition, whale watching can bring education and conservation benefits. My students and I have studied the, the benefits that whale watching passengers gain from going on these trips. And we found that after their tour, whale watching passengers have increased knowledge of whale biology and their conservation measures. And they also show increased support for regulations and guidelines to protect whales. We've also identified some ecological costs of whale watching as well. Scenes such as this, where we have a, a whale blow, um, a group of whales in the middle of the screen here with 13 vessels watching it are not uncommon during the peak of the tourist season in Juneau. In 2017 and 18, my students and I used shore-based tracking to assess changes in humpback whale behavior and movement patterns with respect to whale watching vessels. And we found that when whale watching vessels were within 500 meters of a humpback, those whales responded. And they responded by changing their direction more frequently. They increased their travel speed. They had shorter dives and their breath rate increased. And so we don't yet know the long-term effects of these relatively short-term behavioral changes, but it's possible that these changes through time could lead to decreased feeding efficiency, increased energetic expenditure, or increased stress. And all of these things could lead to long-term negative health outcomes. But there are regulations and guidelines in place to protect humpback whales. In 2001, NOAA established the Humpback Whale Viewing Guidelines in Alaska to minimize harassment of whales. And the primary component of these guidelines is that vessels must remain at least 100 yards from humpback whales. And more recently, NOAA launched the WhaleSense program, which is a voluntary program for whale watch companies that will agree to engage in additional guidelines to protect whales. So it's essentially a best practices in whale viewing um, program. So for example, whale sense vessels are meant to abide by additional approach guidelines to minimize whale disturbance. And in 2019, there were eight Juno whale watch companies that were participating in whale sense. In addition, all boaters Recreational boaters, um, commercial boat operators are encouraged to be vigilant for whales and to give them bubble room. And you may have seen these uh, posters, give whales bubble room at the harbors uh, lately. And so this is just a message to uh, be aware that we are sharing these waters with whales and to remember to give whales space or their bubble room. So when these whales are in Juneau, they're spending most of their time below water feeding and they can pop up in unpredictable places and quite quickly. So it's important just to be aware that there are whales out there and um, to, to slow down in areas where we commonly see whales, which is in Saginaw Channel and Favorite Channel. And the goal of this is to minimize harm and risk, not only to the whales, but to boaters as well, because when boats hit whales, there can also be very deleterious outcomes uh, for the people and the boat, and, and of course the whale. Just this summer, we've actually documented several cases of whale injuries that appear to be from boat strikes. So here we see a whale we nicknamed Helix. And we first photographed this animal on June 22nd, as you can see in the top left, and it showed no sign of injury. Then a little over a month later, on July 31st, we photographed Helix again, and it was apparent that it had been struck at some point by a boat. And the scarring on the whale's left side is indicative of a, an interaction with a boat propeller. And it, it seems that the boat propeller hit the side and ran up along the side of the, the animal to its dorsal fin. So just a reminder again, to, to give whales uh, their, their bubble room, to give them their space. 
So there's also other stressors that, that whales face. It's not just vessel traffic. Um, the blob is a, a recent stressor that affected all aspects of the marine food web from uh, plankton up to whales. And uh, so this is called the marine heat wave. It occurred from 2013 to 2016. It was essentially this very large mass of water in the North Pacific, as you can see in this map. All that red indicates abnormally warm waters, and it persisted for a fairly long period of time. And what we saw with whales during this time and after is that it caused poor body condition. So I took some photos of animals in the Juneau area that were, were skinny. They were very thin and emaciated. In this photo in the, the top left, we can see the prominent blowholes of the whale. And then we see this depression and we call this um, peanut head for lack of a better word. So instead of there being just a smooth contour of, of blubber here from the blowhole back to the dorsal fin, we see this huge depression. And this indicates that there's a loss of blubber or body fat because this animal is probably not getting enough food. And then our colleagues in Glacier Bay very uh, nicely documented this change due to the marine heat wave. So they have a long-term study where they track um, birth rates and the individuals that are in the park year after year. And this graph on the left is showing that the, the number of calves that were produced took a steep nosedive uh, in the years during and also after that marine heat wave. And then also the number of whales encountered as well as shown in this graph on the right also showed a decrease. So it's just important to remember that these whales are facing multiple stressors in our waters. And unfortunately with climate change, it's predicted that these marine heat wave events will continue with a higher frequency. So the, the whale watching industry, is a cruise ship driven industry. The, the growth of the whale watching industry is directly linked to the growth of the cruise ship industry, which is, um, as we all know, very important for the economies and livelihoods of Southeast Alaska. As you can see in this graph, there's been a steady growth in the cruise industry, especially over the past 10 years. And in 2020, last summer, there was expected to be 1.4 million cruise ship passengers in Southeast Alaska, and that was an all-time record high. 98% of cruise ships in Southeast stop in Juneau. So this number approximates the number of passengers that we were expecting in Juneau last summer. As we all know, of course, this didn't happen because of the coronavirus pandemic. And it's an understatement to say that the, the pandemic has had tragic consequences for human health, economies, societies, and lifestyles. At the same time though, this anthropause or this halt in human activity across the, the globe has provided the unprecedented and we hope once in a lifetime opportunity to observe wildlife in the context of reduced human movement. In Juneau, once it became apparent that some and then all of the cruise ships would be canceled during summer 2020, we realized that we had this unique opportunity as scientists to assess humpback whales in the near absence of a vessel traffic near Juneau. So I partnered with colleagues at NOAA Fisheries and UAF and we got a study underway and the BBC Natural History Unit got word of our study and they sent a film crew out last summer to film our work. And they created a short uh, three minute featurette documentary on our work, which I will share with you now. And if for some reason the video isn't coming through smoothly on your end, um, Gloria is going to put the link in the chat so that you can view it later. Thanks, Gloria. This extraordinary year has shown us that wherever we step back, the space we leave is providing wildlife with new opportunities.
this pandemic can help us take a step back and assess the relationship that humans want to have with the natural world. Juno is a premier whale watching destination. In a typical year, we'll have about 1.3 million people visit by cruise ship. And of those, a quarter of them will board smaller boats to go on whale watching trips. This year, we essentially have zero. This year is a really incredible opportunity as a scientist to collect data in the absence of a lot of boats on the water that we can then compare to previous and future years of normal whale watching activity. The number of whale watching boats around a whale increases the amount of sound that a whale is exposed to. Therefore, there's the potential for whales to be more stressed out than they would if they had less disturbance around them. The goal of the study is to determine what is the stress hormone level of these whales during this unusual year. What we're looking for is the concentration of a steroid hormone called cortisol, and we recognize this as stress. Power two, safety off. Let's try and get a little bit closer. When we're collecting our data, we believe we have a fairly minimal impact on the whale. So the biopsy samples that we take, I compare that to getting a finger prick at the doctor's office. So it hurts for just a split second, but then after that, you're fine and you forget about it. We fire this towards the animal. It hits into the side of the animal, and then it bounces off and floats in the water. It's leaking blubber. And when we get it, we have skin and blubber in this coring end. So I'll just hold onto it, okay. you twist. It's a pretty small sample, a little smaller than eraser end of a pencil. I think we got it all, all nice right. job. Good sample. Right. Our results might help to inform management regulations and guidelines for humpback whales in Juneau. So perhaps changes to the number of boats around whales, how long boats stay with whales, and overall how many boats are on the water. This moment provides a really unique opportunity to understand the natural state of whales and other wildlife around the globe. We have an opportunity to slow down a little bit and think about how we interact with wildlife and what that might look like with a little bit more intention. This was part of a larger documentary by BBC called The Year Earth Changed. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's a very well done documentary. It also features our colleagues um, in Wales in Glacier Bay and it's viewable on Apple TV Plus. All right, so I'll go back to my PowerPoint. So as I said, I partnered with colleagues at NOAA Fisheries and UAF, and our overall aim is to answer the question, does tourism impact whales? And the particular focus of this study is to establish baseline measures of humpback whale residency and health in Juneau. So essentially, we, especially last summer, we had this control period with very, very little to no tourism where we can establish how whales might be acting and, and behaving with very little vessel traffic. And then we can use that to compare with years of higher tourism. So we had two objectives. The first one was to determine how many in individuals are present and for how long. And the second objective is to assess stress and reproductive hormone levels. So here's the team. Uh, Shannon Atkinson DeMaster is the uh, lead at University of Alaska Fairbanks. And then from NOAA Fisheries here at Akve Labs in Juneau, we have John Moran, Matt Rogers, and Yasik Maselko. And then also at NOAA Fisheries Protected Resources Division, we have Susie Tierlink. So it was a really nice opportunity to work with the amazing local knowledge of humpback whales that we have here in Juneau. This project wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have this, this local knowledge right here, because of course, especially last summer, no one was traveling. So we really were able to capitalize on the, the stellar scientists that we have right here in Juneau. So our study site is about a 20 mile radius in the, the greater Ock Bay area. And we identified humpback whales by taking photos of their flukes and also their dorsal fins. 
And we measured stress and reproductive hormones in blubber and their blow or their, their breath. So in the, the biopsy sampling that you saw in the video, we are getting a small sample of blubber and also skin. And by measuring the stress hormones in blubber, we are getting a representative of the stress level in that animal from the previous days to weeks. We're also using drones and flying drones through the blow or the exhaled breath of humpback whales when they come to the surface. And there's small petri dishes on the drones that will collect those respiratory droplets in the blow. And the, the stress hormones that we can extract from the blow measures a more instantaneous level of stress in the whale. So in terms of our hormones, we're interested not just in, in stress hormones, but also reproductive hormones as well, because the reproductive state can also affect an animal's stress level. Um, in particular, if an animal is pregnant, that could affect its stress hormone levels. So to assess reproduction in the animals, we are measuring uh, progesterone, which determines ovulation and pregnancy and also testosterone in males, which aids in sperm production and the expression of secondary sexual characteristics. Our stress hormones of interest were cortisol and corticosterone, and they regulate an animal's metabolism and stress response. So for example, through a process called gluconeogenesis, these glucocorticoids or stress hormones uh, they mobilize energy sources and enable the animal to respond to the stressor at hand. And in addition, these stress hormones are also responsible for the general overall metabolic well being of an animal. So, in the lab, uh, briefly, what we do to extract the hormones is that the biopsy samples are cut to weight and the skin is removed. So, that, that black part here is the skin, this is the blubber, this is where the hormones are deposited. And then that blubber is basically ground up or homogenized and um, it's done through a process that uses ethanol. And then finally, there's a technique where the hormone levels are detected using a certain amino assay. And so essentially these are the vials you get back after running that assay test. And if there's no color, that means that there's a lot of hormone present. So for last summer's field effort, we collected data from May 17th through October 10th. We had 32 days on the water, 184 hours of effort. And we collected 34 blubber biopsy samples. These were from 24 individuals. And 10 of those individuals, we resampled twice. So we wanted to track changes in these animal stress hormones through time. So we were able to do that with 10 individuals. And then for our, our drone work, we were able to collect 12 blow samples from seven individuals. So in support of our first objective to determine how many whales were present and for how long, we identified a total of 63 adult whales. And this included six mom calf pairs. And for me, this was pretty exciting because this is the highest number of mom calf pairs that I've seen that I've seen in my study site since I started working here. Um, so it was really nice to see this number of mom calf pairs. On average, we saw 13 humpback whales per survey, and each whale was present in Juneau on average for 39 days. Uh, but some whales were present for about the entire field season. So this animal here. Uh, it's a female, her name is Tucker, and uh, she was present in Juneau for essentially the whole field season, 145 days. Uh, this is a picture of Flame, one of our more well-known whales, and she was the most sighted whale. We were able to photograph her on 26 different days. So in terms of our, our hormone analysis from last year, uh, we met Remember that we measured some reproductive hormones because those can affect stress in an animal. And progesterone is an indication of pregnancy. And so we plotted the progesterone levels of all of our whales on this graph. And we can see that there were uh, five whales that had really elevated progesterone samples. There's actually two whales represented by this big star here. 
And so this indicates that these whales were most likely pregnant at the time of sampling. And so this summer, we've been able to confirm three of those pregnancies because we've had flame and niblet and tucker all come back with calves. And then going back to flame, this famous whale, she's pretty amazing because she has a calf this year. She had a calf in 2020 and she had a calf in 2019. So she has successfully given birth to a calf three years in a row, which is virtually unheard of for humpback whales. Usually females give birth every two or three years. And the fact that flame has done this three years in a row and successfully reared those calves is pretty amazing. And so we're calling her a super female. So here's our plot of the cortisol levels. And the thing to look at here is that each of these dots represents the cortisol level or the, the stress hormone level of a different whale. So we see most of these whales fall out in kind of a, a grouping here of relatively low level of hormone, but then we have three that are outliers that are higher than the rest. And so we're, we're trying to figure out what might be driving these higher stress levels. And we're hoping that we can resample these whales um, this season and, and try to figure out what's, what's driving these higher cortisol levels. So in terms of our blow sampling, uh, we're still working out these methods. It's still a pretty new technique for humpback whales in particular, but also for free ranging individuals. And so we're, we're working out the technique both in the field and in the lab, but we are making progress. Uh, so over the past year, we've been able to validate the hormones, meaning that in the lab, we were able to both detect hormones being present in the blow and we were able to assign a numerical measure to them. And we've done this with progesterone, testosterone, and cortisol. So the next step will be to, to measure the hormone in each individual and then interpret all of those results. And so we're still working out these methods uh, this year. Another thing that we noticed last year was that there seemed to be a lot of prey in the area. And it, it seems that in this area anyway, um, the prey are back to a relatively healthy level that indicates that it could have been uh, rebounding from that marine heat wave or the blob. So herring is the predominant food source that we see for humpback whales during the summer. And what we're seeing on this slide are pictures of five different snapshots from our echo sounder on the research boat, which is basically a fish finder where there's um, high frequency sounds that are sent through the water column and they bounce off of either the seafloor or anything in the water column like fish or whales. And then we see that as a signal on our, on our echo sounder. And so I'll walk you through these graphs here. So at the bottom of each of these, you'll see a big number that represents the seafloor depth in feet. And then you'll see the, the big reddish color towards the bottom. This indicates the seafloor. And then we have the scattering or these different colors of red and yellow. And so this is the stuff that we're looking for that's, that, that, that high frequency sound is bouncing off of. So here on the left, we see a big herring school that's sitting right on the shelf here at about 222 feet deep. Sometimes we get whales on the echo sounder, which is always fun to see. So here at uh, about 58 feet, we see what could be a mother and her calf at the bottom. Over here in the middle, we see a depth of 154 feet and we see this very thick prey layer at the bottom. Again, likely herring just shown up here. And this looks like a whale that's diving down to that herring layer. Over here, we see another uh, likely school of herring between about 70 and 100 feet. And here, there's a whale uh, probably diving down to it. And then this last one here, we see a uh, deeper seafloor, 415 feet. We see all of this prey at the bottom, a very rich herring school. And then all of these blobs here are whales diving down. So, we're looking at prey because prey and how much an animal is eating can also impact 
an animal's health and particularly its stress hormone levels. So in summary, through this work, we were able to take advantage of an unprecedented opportunity last summer in the near absence of tourism in Juneau. We established a solid baseline of whale residency and reproductive and stress hormone levels. And we can then use this in comparing to previous years before the pandemic and hopefully future years after the pandemic. And it is important though to note that these stress hormones do vary naturally during the life of a whale, even in the absence of human caused or natural stressors. And so we're trying to control for some of those things as much as we can. And ultimately the goal of this work is to foster a sustainable whale watching industry that protects the resource upon which it relies, which of course are the humpback whales. So we are continuing the study this year. Up until the end of July, there were still no large cruise ships in Juneau. And still, even though we do have some ships coming into town, tourism is still greatly reduced from pre-pandemic levels. So this gives us additional time to understand the behavior and health of humpback whales during periods of lower tourism. We're continuing with photo ID and have identified more than 40 whales so far with four mother calf pairs identified. And we're also continuing with the biopsy sampling. And so far we've collected 37 biopsy samples on 26 individuals. We're also collecting more systematic prey data and trying to understand how this might impact those stress levels. And finally, we're refining those blow sampling methods that we're using with the drone. So analysis of last year's data is still ongoing, and we would love to continue this study into next year when it's more likely that tourism will be back to, to more normal levels, probably still not to the level as before the pandemic, but probably more than this year. And so that would give us three years of sampling these whales, um, oftentimes the same whales year after year to understand how their behavior and health might change under different tourism levels. And so again, our goal here is to promote the, the sustainability of this important industry for Juno and to protect the whales themselves. So with that, I'll thank everyone for your attention. Uh, there's many people that have assisted with this work. Uh, science never occurs alone. It always takes a big team, especially when you're studying large animals in the ocean like humpback whales. So I'm really grateful for all the people that are collaborating on this project and also to our funding. So we've been funded by NOAA Fisheries through a grant to the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission. We've also received support from Alaska Inbury and BLAST. So thanks so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. I have a few questions that came in through the chat. Um, the first one was from Nancy Waterman. Are whales over harvesting their food supply in Southeast? No, there's no indications that they are. Okay. Sue Schrader asked, does the 68 whale watching boats include sport fishing charter boats that also advertise whale watching opportunities? That does not, no. So that 68 represents 20 companies where they are focused just on whale watching. So if we included those sport fishing boats, it would be many more. Okay. Brianna Petty is asking um, about a specific whale, the underweight, underweight whale. Um, Brianna, do you want to just verbalize your, your question? I want to make sure that, that I capture it. Yeah, I can. So <laughs> there was the peanut head whale. Um, I was just wondering if that was 2147 because the dorsal fin kind of looked like them, but I wasn't sure. And so I was just going to ask. Yeah, you're, you're awesome, Brianna. You're absolutely right. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, her name is Moon Cheese. Yes, that is yeah. Moonshoes. <laughs> Good yeah, catch. I didn't know that she had a, a peanut head at any point. I haven't seen her in a bit. Uh, yeah. Thank you, though. <laughs> that picture was from, you know, a few years ago. Okay. She looks much better this year. 
Yeah, much chunkier. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Peggy Cowan is asking, was there any parallel research um, to you conducted in Hawaii during this per period of lower tourism? Mm. I, let me think about this. I believe so. I believe that there was a team that went out and also collected biopsy samples. My knowledge of that is a little bit fuzzy, but I do know across the humpback whale research world, there have been different teams looking at this question. Alaska, Wild, um, Alaska Whale Foundation has some, done some work. There's a group in California. So I would expect, yes, that they've also done uh, some work to assess what's going on with the whales during the pandemic. Um, a few more are coming in through the chat, but I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that you are also welcome to just verbalize your questions. Um, one came in from Scott. Did you want to verbalize yours or do you want me to read it for you? I'll read it. <laughs> um, he says, Spot was a major photo player in your program. I've not seen him since 2016 and there are no happy whale sightings of him either. Do you have any information on him? Yeah, Scott, that's a good observation. I don't, and if that animal hasn't been seen on happy whale, that is a, a signal that something may have happened. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know, Scott, that's a good question. I wish I knew. And, and follow-up question, um, is Helix the calf of 1820 niblet? No, no, so Helix, is a small whale, it's not a calf. We're categorizing that whale as a subadult. So it is not a calf this year. I don't know who its mother was. Okay. Sue, did you want to ask your own question? Okay. Go, go ahead, please. Okay. <laughs> Sue says, given that the blob will likely recur, is NM NM sorry, NMFS being pro proactive in considering regulating the whale watching industry in Juneau? I can't answer that question. I know NIMPS is regularly um, evaluating their whale watching uh, guidelines in particular with respect to whale sense but I don't know for certain how much that climate change specifically is playing into those decisions. Okay, and Sue also asks, of the 68 whale watching boats, how many have signed on to the Whale Sense program? So that those 68, as I mentioned, represents 20 companies. And that was an account that's from 2018 or so um, published by my, my student, Ali Schuler. And so in 2019, before the pandemic, when there was normal tourism, my knowledge from NIMS is that eight of those 20 companies were part of WhaleSense. But I don't know how many individual vessels that represents, but WhaleSense, it's the company that joins and then all of its vessels are part of it. Okay, I have one more question here in the chat um, from Scott. It says, was there a single dominant change in behavior during the anthropause? Mm. Yes, and this is something that we've all noticed, even our colleagues in Glacier Bay that haven't necessarily quantified it, but we did see last year more resting behavior of humpback whales, and uh, we did see them forming more groups, so we tended to see them more in, in pairs or, or triplets with one another. Another thing that we have been discussing this year as well as last year, it seems like we did see more resting whales and they tended to be resting more in the middle of channels. Whereas this year, we're seeing that resting behavior more along the, the shoreline of channels. So it could be that there was this shift in their, where, where they are resting in response to the vessel traffic. Nancy's asking, do humpbacks vocalized much in Southeast Alaska, and what can we learn from that? Mm, they do, yes. And unfortunately, acoustics has not been at the forefront of my research, but we have been collaborating with an acoustician, Michelle Fournay from Cornell University. 
and she has deployed hydrophones in the North Pass region of Juneau uh, last year and this year, and we're actually collaborating with her on that study. I don't know what she's found yet, but I do know just by talking with her that she did record um, quieter oceans here in Juneau last year and more vocalizations of humpback whales than uh, we would expect in other years. So that's a question that we're, uh, we're going to dive into more in the future. Okay, that's all I have in chat right now, but I would open it up to anyone who wants to ask a question. Here's one. <laughs> Carla asks, would whales benefit from a sanctuary area in the region where boat traffic is not allowed or heavily regulated? It's possible. And, you know, one of the things we're trying to uncover in, in this study is if, if something like that uh, could do some, some good. That's under the purview of, of NOAA Fisheries, the regulatory body, but it's possible that they could benefit from it. I know in other regions of heavy uh, vessel traffic and humpback whales, there are sanctuaries. So such as in Hawaii, there's the um, Hawaii humpback whale sanctuary. And then where I used to live and work in New England, there's the Stellwagen Bank. National Marine Sanctuary. So there are examples out there of other regions where there are marine sanctuaries around humpback whale hotspots. Bev is asking, is whale watching season over now? It is not, no. This year, uh, the last time I saw the cruise ship calendar, we were going to have cruise ships here through the end of October. And so, the, the cruise ships are tied to the, the whale watching season. And so we're actually planning to collect data through the end of October uh, this year. Usually whale watching season ends around the end of September. Um, and we do have whales here. I mean, just because the season ends doesn't mean the whales disappear. We have whales here through October, November. Um, I mean, most months of the year around Juneau, you can see whales, but they just, the the, density really drops off during the winter time. Ixie is asking, when do the whales head south? They tend to start heading south probably uh, around this time. Uh, we, as far as I know, we don't have any hard data on the Juno whales, but we definitely, through our photo ID data, we can track when we stop seeing individuals. And so September, October usually is, is when I would say most of them would, would start heading south. Scott is asking, how many Juno whales have been recorded in Mexico? Mm, that's a great question. And so with that, my knowledge comes from Happy Whale. And I know from the whales that I've submitted to Happy Whale, there have been only two that I can think of off the top of my head that have been cited in, in Mexico, but that's just from my, my site, my sightings. And um, again, I would encourage you to play around with Happy Whale and see how many you find in Mexico. Nancy says, should we consider limited entry and whale watching? Uh, how would we approach that? That is has certainly been discussed by multiple entities in Juneau. There are some places that do have limited entry, which is essentially a cap on the number of whale watching companies. And how you would approach that, again, I'm getting a little bit out of my, my waters here because that's really a policy and regulatory thing, but it would be a discussion, I would imagine, between uh, NOAA Fisheries. I imagine the city might be involved um, and the state. It, it certainly could be something that could be driven from the community level, from the uh, resident level as well, I would imagine. Okay. Lori is asking, we saw many whales near the mouth of Mendenhall River in December. Any reason why? Oh, interesting. Well, um, my first guess would be that there was a rich food supply there and they were taking advantage of that. Okay. 
Brianna noted uh, that some of those whales were flame and magma and some GB Glacier Bay whales. <laughs> Glacier Bay, yes, I think. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Does anyone have any more questions before we wrap up? John is noting that there, this is one of your teammates, I guess, right? Um, that there were herring in Fritz Cove last winter. Yes, and from, from Happy Whale, I know that flame was around in Fritz Cove, probably feeding on herring. And with flame, we know from our biopsy sampling that last year she was lactating because she still had a calf and she was also pregnant at the same time. So I'm sure she was very hungry. And maybe that's one of the reasons that she, she stayed in Juno so long into the winter last year feeding is because she needed to put on that extra weight. Scott is asking, where does the 10% to Mexico number come from? That comes from biopsy data from a large uh, genetics project that was done throughout the North Pacific. Um, however, now with Happy Whale and this great source of knowledge we have with people contributing photos from all over the North Pacific, there are some indications that perhaps there's more whales going to Mexico than we previously thought. But that, that number right now comes from genetic data. Okay. Lori says, so where did Flame get pregnant if she was here in December? Well, it only takes about, about a month or so to get to Hawaii. So she would have had time to get to Hawaii and, and mate and um, get back up here. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank Heidi for your presentation today. Um, <laughs> um, so this program is being recorded. So anybody who didn't get a chance to, um, to watch it that you know of, they can uh, see it on the same site where you went to register. Um, soon that button for registration will turn to video, but um, but anyway, thank you, Heidi. And uh, if there's any questions that come in afterwards, you know, feel free to send them to our office or to Heidi directly, and um, we'll try to get those answered for you. But thank you, Heidi. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.